It's their first taste of freedom. Researchers are releasing several Przewalski horses into the wild. In the 1960s, these wild horses were near extinction in their native Mongolia. But they survived captivity and are now being reintroduced along the Mongolian border with China. What happens when you take a species once thought extinct and give it a second chance? Not in a zoo, not behind glass. Nope. I'm talking about the wild, where life is brutal and survival is earned. Endangered wild horses are returning to the steppes of Kazakhstan for the first time in 200 years. It's part of an ambitious scheme to return them to their original habitat. Yeah, I think that even the best horse trainer, if they try to use the techniques, some of the more traditional techniques of horse training on them, they'd probably get flattened. That's exactly what scientists did in China's Gobi Desert. It sounds reckless because when you think about it, the Gobi is ruthless, scorching heat, bone-cracking winters, predators everywhere. Could it get any worse? Into that chaos, they released a herd of wild horses. But not just any horses. These were Przewalski's horses, the last truly wild horses on Earth. For decades, they were gone, extinct in the wild, forgotten by nature. Even after breeding programs brought their numbers up, no one believed they could survive outside captivity. But something incredible happened. Nature fought back and life refused to lose. What started as a desperate experiment turned into a symbol of survival itself. This is not just a story about horses. It's a story about what it means to fight for life. Meet Przewalski's horse. Some call it Shuvalski. Others say Perzhuvalski. Either way, this horse doesn't care what you call it. It's built different. No, seriously, this ain't your average horse. It's short, stocky, and comes with a super thick neck. And let's not forget that upright mane either that makes it look like it's ready for battle. Eyes like it remembers glaciers, mammoths, and saber-toothed cats. I could just go on and on about this beautiful beast. But back to the story. Once upon a time, these horses ruled the wild. From Mongolia to Central Europe, they galloped across ancient plains like kings. Wild, untamed, free, no saddles, and definitely no jumping competitions either. But like a lot of wild things, they met us. And that was the beginning of the end. By the 1960s, Puwalski's horses were declared extinct in the wild. They were wiped off the face of the earth. Why, you might ask? Simple. Hunters wanted trophies. Farmers wanted their grasslands. You know the drill. Domesticated livestock took over their food. And just like that, the last wild horse on earth became a ghost. But extinction didn't win. Not yet. Twelve. That's how many were left. Not in the wild, but in zoos scattered across Europe. Just twelve. Imagine the pressure. Twelve horses stood between survival and forever disappearing into history books. Most scientists would have given up, but not this crew. They got to work, carefully pairing the horses, managing bloodlines like ancient royalty, hoping each new foal wouldn't be the last. Every single birth was a small miracle, and slowly, against the odds, those 12 became 50. 50 became 100. By the 1990s, there were enough to ask a hopeful question. What if we didn't stop here? What if these weren't museum pieces behind glass? What if they could be wild again? It sounded impossible, but the dream was too powerful to ignore. The answer came from China, deep in the brutal wilds of the Kalamaili Nature Reserve. Picture dry plains, cracked earth, wolves, and brutal winters. The kind of place that doesn't care about survival, or wild horses for that matter. If these horses could survive here, they could survive anywhere. In 2001, a group of Chinese scientists made the call. Release them, let them run, no cages. 12 horses once stood 
between life and extinction. Now, it was their turn to fight for the wild. But you may ask, why the Gobi Desert? Why release wild horses into one of the harshest places on Earth? Doesn't really seem like a smart plan, does it? Well, to be fair, it was like a wild gamble. Blistering summers, freezing winters, wolves, snow leopards, dry, cracked land stretching as far as the eye can see. You name it. This was by far the most brutal place for a horse. But here's the twist. The Gobi wasn't always like this. Thousands of years ago, this place was rolling grassland. Rivers flowed. Herds of wild animals grazed under open skies. Horses thrived here long before humans left footprints on these plains. And even now, scattered patches of ancient steppe remain. Bits of green clinging to life like a memory of what used to be. And that, my friends, gave scientists a crazy idea. What if bringing the horses back could help heal the land itself? You know, something like nature, restoring nature. There was another reason too. Politics. Yep, you heard that right. Politics. China wanted to prove something to the world. Conservation success. A national symbol of environmental leadership. And what better way to do that than by saving the world's last truly wild horse? There was cultural meaning too. Horses hold deep symbolic power in Chinese culture. Just like the dragon represents a lot of things, these horses represent freedom, strength, and unbreakable spirit. The site they chose was the Kalamaili Nature Reserve, deep in the eastern edge of the Gobi Desert. This place was huge, more than 18,000 square kilometers, protected, isolated, and of course, brutal. It had predators. It had brutal seasons. It had the wild uncertainty that makes or breaks survival. In 2001, the first small group of Przewalski's horses arrived, shipped by plane. They were watched carefully by scientists, almost like that Jurassic film in which they revived raptors. Radio collars tracked their every move. The big question hovered over everyone. Could they do it? Could animals raised in fenced pastures suddenly go wild again? Nobody knew, and the immediate guess was no. The first year was chaotic. Within weeks of being released, everything that could go wrong went wrong. Some of the horses wandered too far from the group. Others ended up in wolf territory and were ripped to shreds. A few struggled to find enough water in the harsh desert heat and eventually succumbed to the heat. It was brutal to watch. Every radio signal lost felt like a punch to the gut. Scientists feared they had made a massive mistake. Had they just thrown these animals into a slow death? And that's when something strange happened. The horses began to adapt. Small groups started forming naturally as stallions began leading mares and foals, guiding them to safer ground. Biologists watching from afar were stunned. This wasn't behavior taught in captivity. No, sir, this was something buried deep in their blood, something ancient finally waking up again. And that was only the start. The horses figured out how to dig for water in dry creek beds. They learned which areas to avoid during hunting hours. They followed old instincts, mapping out invisible trails their ancestors had used thousands of years ago. Even more incredible, they began teaching each other. Older mares showed younger ones how to spot danger. Stallions fought off smaller predators. Mothers became fierce protectors of their newborns. The group was no longer a collection of captive horses set loose. They were a wild herd again. When winter hit, some horses didn't make it. Nature doesn't hand out free passes, but thankfully, most of them survived. And when spring arrived, something happened that sent chills through the entire team of biologists. Footage. The first foal was born. Wild, free, breathing desert air. 
That one fold changed everything. This wasn't just survival anymore. This was a comeback story and the star of the show, that one fold. The reintroduction was finally working, but the surprises kept coming. Satellite trackers showed the herds were expanding their territory. They moved into rougher regions, places that experts once assumed would be too harsh for them. The horses didn't care though. They pushed forward, one hoof at a time, taking back what was once theirs. It wasn't supposed to happen like this. Conservation projects like this usually take years or decades to show results. Yet here they were, not even a full year in, already rewriting the rule book. How was it possible? Well, truth be told, it all came down to one thing. These weren't domesticated horses forced to play wild. Nope, captive or not, their DNA was pure, untouched, and primitive. They remembered, even after generations in captivity, the wild had never left them. And something else was changing too. The land was responding. Grass around water holes grew thicker. Wolf patterns shifted. Birds returned to areas they hadn't visited in years. These horses weren't just hanging on. They were reshaping the Gobi Desert, and it was only the beginning. Fast forward 10 years. By 2011, the population of Przewalski's horses had tripled. Dozens of foals were born in the wild, each one stronger and smarter than the last. The herd wasn't just surviving anymore, it was actually thriving. And with their return, something remarkable began to happen. Parts of the Kalameli Reserve that had been silent and barren for decades were coming back to life. Native grasses, long pushed out by drought and invasive plants, started reclaiming the land. Birds began returning, rodents followed. Even the insect populations exploded, rebuilding the very foundation of the desert's food chain. It all traced back to one change. The return of the horses almost sounds like a Star Wars movie, but this is actually called a trophic cascade. A single species, especially one at the top of a food web, can trigger a domino effect throughout an entire ecosystem. The Prisowalski's horses didn't just fit into the desert, they redefined it. And they weren't doing it by accident. They dug into dry riverbeds, uncovering hidden water. Those new watering holes became lifelines for other animals in the area. They trampled over invasive shrubs, breaking up roots and allowing native grasses to breathe again. Even their dung played a part, fertilizing the ground and helping to build richer soil. But here's the most shocking part. None of this was directed by humans. There were no feeding stations, no interventions or whatever. The horses figured it all out on their own. Believe it or not, scientists actually have a name for this. They call it genetic memory. It's just a fancy word for ancient survival skills passed down through DNA, resurfacing even after generations in captivity. The instincts had never left. They were just waiting for the right moment to return. This changed everything researchers thought they knew about extinction and survival. It raised a powerful question though. If a species on the brink of extinction could not only survive, but rebuild an ecosystem, what else might be possible? Well, the possibilities are endless, but I hope scientists don't get any wild ideas. Sabertooth. The last thing we'd want is a group of wild, deadly sabertooths on the loose. But yeah, what started as an experiment with a few wild horses had become something much bigger. It was a glimpse into a different future for conservation. A future where nature doesn't always need saving, it just needs a chance to remember itself. The desert was healing, and it was all because the wild, get this, remembered how to be wild again. Cool, right? But this story was never going to be easy. In 2015, disaster struck. 
A brutal winter swept across the Gobi Desert. Temperatures dropped to minus 40 degrees Celsius. Thick layers of snow buried every blade of grass. Water sources froze solid. The aftermath? Dozens of horses didn't make it. And as always, the headlines were quick to follow because any little success the scientists had was all wiped out by this. Some even declared the project a complete failure. Others questioned if wild horses ever belonged in the desert to begin with, and if you ask me, they had a point. Conservationists were accused of gambling with nature itself. But the scientists didn't panic. They stood firm, reminding everyone that this was the wild. No safety nets or shelters, only the survival of the fittest. If the horses were going to survive, it had to be real survival. And against the odds, the herd pushed through. When spring arrived, the survivors looked different. They were lean, they were stronger, and they were smarter about where to find food and shelter. Should we be bringing back wild animals? And what if we end up bringing back the wrong species? What then? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more interesting videos in the future. Thanks for watching and see you next time.